Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our session. I'm Alex Dawson. I'm a software engineer. My focus on first encounters was gameplay programming, the mesh destruction system, and the creature behaviors. Hey everyone, I'm Zach Dawson. I'm a prototyper at Meta, and I was a game designer on First Encounters. I focused especially on defining the core game loop to determine what the player is doing throughout the experience, and overall just ensuring that everything felt consistent and fun. Today we're gonna to be talking to you about how First Encounters incorporated the player's room into the level. We're also gonna dive into some of the problems that we encountered, and how we approached developing an experience that blends your physical room into a virtual world. So let's start off by talking a bit about what First Encounters is in case you haven't had a chance to play it or if you just need a refresher. So First Encounters is Meta's launch title that incorporates players, that introduces players rather, to mixed reality on the Quest 3. It's a showcase of the technology and the potential that this device can enable, but beyond that, we expected that this is the first time that players would be experiencing mixed reality. So with that in mind, we wanted to design an experience that was gentle and slowly built on itself so that players could take time to appreciate the color pass-through, the visual effects happening inside of their space, and just overall you know, appreciate this feeling of having an experience happening within their own room. So in the game, these little creatures that we called Puffians invade your room. A mysterious spacecraft crashes through your ceiling, and it lands somewhere in the middle of the room. We call this a lander, and we're going to talk about how we decided where it would land in your room later in this talk. So next, the lander gives the player a flashlight, which lets them see through their walls. We're really trying to lean into the player's feeling of curiosity here and maybe a bit of an uncertainty as well. The flashlight encourages the player to explore their room and it hints at the idea of this larger world outside of their space. We'll also introduce the Puffians at this stage. They start to knock on the player's walls and then they really bash into them. This builds until they finally smash their way into your room, leaving a big hole in your wall that you can look through. We'll talk about how we approach the wall destruction in this talk. Finally, players get to the main gameplay section here they collect matching color Puffians, racing to get a high score and stacking them up on the lander. And I like to think of this as a hybrid between a match three game and a shooter. The creatures are swarming all over your walls and furniture and the player is collecting them by shooting them with their capture pistol. This is the part of the game where we really get into showing the potential that mixed reality has to extend your physical space into a virtual space. And we're gonna go into detail on some of the challenges that we ran into when designing an experience like this. So while designing First Encounters, we kept three guiding pillars in mind. First, we had to uphold player expectations. Every part of the game needed to feel grounded and physical so that players could suspend their disbelief. Second, we wanted to seamlessly blend the virtual and physical worlds. We wanted players to feel as if their room had been transported onto the surface of an alien planet. Third, each reveal needed to build on the last. Every reveal provides opportunities to happily surprise the player. By slowly building expectations for the player, we could take players along a narrative that felt like it evolved naturally. Even from our earliest prototype, we designed around three different modalities. First, there's tangible interactions inside the room, intangible interactions outside, and then combining the two at the intersection. Each modality came with its own constraints and benefits. Inside the room, players feel like they could reach out and touch the augments that are there. These augments are viewed with a much higher degree of scrutiny, but they can have a much more deep and personal impact. Outside, objects become intangible beyond the play space. This gives an opportunity to ground these elements as part of a much larger fantasy world. When combined, that tangible feeling suddenly extends outside the player's space. The player can imagine that all of these objects have a similar weight and feel to them. We're gonna dive deeper into the benefits and challenges that we encountered as we were exploring each of these modalities. So inside the room, players retain their everyday context about the world and what feels right for those objects inside it. Augments here need to adapt to the space. We do this using procedural techniques, such as procedural placement and behaviors that react to the environment around them. The frame of reference the player has means that they can quickly lose their feeling of uh, suspension of disbelief if we don't recognize their expectations first before establishing new ones. 
When done right, we can surprise the player without breaking that fantasy that they could reach out and touch these objects. So the very first reveal, sorry. So the very first reveal of the game is a lander crushing, crashing through your ceiling. We want to make sure that it had a lot of impact, not just with your ceiling, but also emotionally. This reveal needed to introduce this idea of a world outside of your room. It also needed to establish a feeling of physicality to the virtual objects that we're introducing. Lastly, the lander is an important focal point for the remainder of the gameplay. We use it as a central scoreboard throughout the game, so the player needs to remain aware of its location. It's meant that we needed to take great care in selecting a position for it to land. It had to be somewhere that was visible, open, and accessible. So with such an important first reveal, we also wanted to make sure the player didn't just look away and miss it, because in reality, there's a lot of distractions, and therefore, in mixed reality, there's a lot of distractions as well. We gradually eased into the break-in moment with the ceiling cracking and uh, little pieces of debris falling that bounce off of your mesh, but we also made use of the spatial audio APIs from Presence Platform here, and it really went a long way in drawing the player's attention to this reveal. Now let's talk a bit more about how we chose a landing position. So selecting a landing position really came down to three factors. The centering within the room, the flatness of your surface, and the direction that the player is facing. We chose a variety of candidates on the room mesh, uh, just selecting points fairly uniformly, and then we score these candidates based on the above criteria to pick the best one. So we preferred points that are more centered in the room so that we would avoid cases where the lander lands right beside a wall or away from the usable area of the player's space. It felt a lot more natural to look into your room, especially in the early stage of the game when your walls were still solid. And this also helped keep the focal point accessible no matter where you're standing within your space. We also tried to prefer plat flat sections of the mesh uh, and they didn't need to be perfectly flat, but this helped it keep the uh, lander off of clutter or off of unexpected surfaces, and it avoided cases where the lander might be intersecting with furniture. Lastly, we considered the direction that the player is facing. So if there's a good candidate position already straight in front of the player, we wouldn't have to work as hard to draw their attention to another point within the room. In practice, we found that this criteria helped us pick tabletops, beds, and open floor space of the room quite nicely. Another really important topic to dive into when you're designing an experience in your room is how you'll design around pass-through. So in case you don't know, pass-through is the term for the Presence Platform API that gives you the headset's camera feed. So in, in order to understand how to work with pass-through, we really need to understand how pass-through works behind the scenes because in a very literal sense, pass-through is working behind the scenes. The device runs a completely separate process to capture a color camera feed and display it alongside your app. Your game does not have access to this camera feed. So how do you build a pass-through app without a camera feed? How do you go about doing something like break holes in your wall if you don't have texture data to apply to the mesh pieces? So let's go over how pass-through is working from the app's point of view. Pass-through is rendered in its own layer. Specifically, it's an underlay with the game rendering over it. You can think of this as two separate video feeds. One is the camera image, and the other is the last frame rendered by your game. The game's render frame is then alpha blended onto the pass-through image. You can think of this just as applying an alpha mask to your entire game. Uh, now, it's important to note that this is immediately raising a lot of limitations, especially related to blending. For example, alpha blending and additive blending can't be used interchangeably here. This especially applies to VFX, like fire or glow effects, where you typically want to use an additive blend. All of the VFX in First Encounters are just using alpha blending. The next thing you want to consider is how your app is going to render pass-through, or more specifically, how you're gonna generate the alpha mask used to reveal this pass-through underlay. You can just set the camera clear to full alpha, and this will show pass-through anywhere that your game doesn't render. And this is great if you're just rendering a few augments or if you're rendering a user interface in mixed reality, but the drawback here is that your virtual content will always be on top of pass-through. You don't get any occlusions. So for first encounters, we opted to use a pass-through material instead on the destructible scene mesh. So let's take a closer look at this. We'll call it mesh pass-through. The main benefits to using the mesh to render pass-through are that you get a form of static occlusions for free from your scene. And we were also able to modify this mesh to determine where we were going to render pass-through. So when we wanted to break a hole in your wall, we would modify the mesh itself and immediately you'd be able to see the virtual environment beyond it. There's also a number of drawbacks here. For example, you're now rendering a lot of triangles to generate a potentially simple mask, especially at the early stages of the game where you just have a hole in your ceiling. You're also relying on the user to scan their scene and hopefully do a good job when they're going through the scan process, because if they choose to rush through it, it could lead to really low quality occlusions. And these occlusions are also limited to the objects that were a part of the scan initially, so dynamic occlusions aren't going to work with this process, like for your hands or for other people in the room or if a player moves their furniture around. 
And you also can't forget, at the end of the day, all we're doing here is generating that alpha mask. There's no texture data that we're working with here. So we can't do something like render textured pieces of the wall as they crumble and fall into your mesh. So with all this understood, we are able to convincingly blend the physical and virtual worlds. And our flashlight example is a really great use case for this, where we make the walls translucent to show the alien planet through your room. We're still just working with an alpha mask here over a pass-through video feed, but we were really able to make it feel like your walls were disappearing despite all of these constraints. So we've talked about inside the room. Let's talk a bit about outside the room. In contrast to inside, objects outside are generally isolated and don't interfere with the player's space. Thanks to this, the majority of this space is not going to interfere with the player's room. This gives us the freedom to hand design this area of the level. We use this to build out a larger world that grounds the fantasy elements of the game. Despite being outside, this world is much more than a simple backdrop. Gameplay can still take place out here, and we can continue to respect any interaction the player can do at a distance. Because players are always physically removed from this space, it feels a lot more like playing a game on a screen. Traditional gameplay mechanics translate very easily here. Now let's talk about one of the first problems that we encountered during prototyping. We noticed that puffins were getting stuck when they were trying to enter the room. So we saw that puffins were trying to jump through walls, but they would just bounce off of the reserved areas of the mesh. And we also found them getting underneath the floor and trying to jump up through the floorboards. They would just stay there until eventually they despawned. Ultimately, this was all caused by the unpredictability of the room placement uh, within the scene. Uh, the scene API is giving us a mesh with a fairly arbitrary origin, and it's rotated and positioned around this point. So the solution for us was to simply take the room and position it ourselves. We determined the center of the room, and we placed that at the origin of our scene. Then we aligned the floor with the ground plane of the alien planet, uh, and with these changes, we were able to create a feeling of your room really being a part of the environment. It felt like you were at the center of this world, and almost as if you could just step outside of your walls and start exploring the planet. And now, of course, Puffians had no trouble jumping into the room anymore, and there's no space for them to get stuck under the floor. But with the room position, the next step was to make sure it actually stayed put where we wanted it. When you're working with mixed reality, you can't assume that the objects you spawn are going to stay in place relative to the real world. The headset is constantly mapping and estimating its position within the room, and you'll find that your scene can drift as a consequence of this. An even more dramatic example of this is when the player takes off and puts on their headset again. In this case, you might find your objects teleport a fairly significant distance. So to account for this, we need a consistent frame of reference to the real world, and we usually use what's called spatial anchors for this. Anchors are a part of a system-level API through Presence Platform that track a point in space and keep its position consistent relative to the real world. So it's exactly what we're looking for here. Now, the typical approach would be to take an anchor and just directly anchor your content. You would attach your virtual objects to the anchors that you're creating, and the anchor will update in real time, keep its position consistent. It would be great. This is fine when you have a few objects, but in our case, we have a massive scene with thousands of objects. On top of that, we're simulating physics for all these creatures as they're crawling over your furniture. So if we tried to anchor everything, we would have a huge performance impact. And if we only anchored the room, we'd have a problem with the puffians clipping through your walls. So instead of content anchoring, the solution for our use case was to account for tracking drift in the camera. We kept the world and your room static relative to Unity's origin, and then we created an anchor as usual, but we don't attach anything to it. Instead, we just observe how this anchor drifts, and we apply the opposite translation to the camera. This creates the illusion of the world being attached to the anchor, and we, we still account for the tracking space changes this way, but we maintain a relative consistency between the game elements and the physical room. Now that we've positioned the player's room, we need to keep in mind that anything we place too close to it could intersect and interfere unrealistically with the room's geometry. We want to be able to place objects anywhere in the level out here, even if they're just outside the player's room. Despite this, we don't know the shape of the player's room at design time. This seems like a complicated problem, um, but we were able to come up with a pretty simple solution that worked really well. Um, at runtime, instead of trying to procedurally generate content here, we pre-author all of our content and then just remove the content that intersects. This worked really well and let the level designers uh, work without having to worry about procedural content placement here. Um, so we've talked about avoiding these unintentional intersections. Let's talk about intentionally combining both the inside and outside of the room.
Objects don't need to be restricted to solely being inside or outside the room. When we combine both spaces and let objects move back and forth between the two, we can choose to give players the chance to have a more personal um, uh, interaction with those objects. They suddenly become tangible. This can be used to give players the sense that the entire world we have created has that physicality and weight even if we're only letting some of those objects be tangible at any given moment. Um, whereas inside the room relates closely to augmented reality, and outside the room relates closely to virtual reality, here at the intersection is where we really see the benefits that mixed reality provides. So the core mechanic that ties together our game is the mesh destruction. Almost every reveal that we have and every interaction can destroy the scene mesh and reveal this interplanetary vista outside. It's worth noting the player is not punished for breaking open their walls. Instead, we let the player discover that they can break open their walls themselves and use that to their advantage in collecting approaching puffians. This mechanic was around since our earliest prototypes. Early on, we implemented this uh, using a quick and easy prototype version. But we had to redo this, uh, the code for this twice. First, we used uh, some off-the-shelf libraries as an exploration to see if they would be uh, what we were looking for. But ultimately, we had to write a completely custom system in order to achieve the performance we wanted. So we noted earlier that pass-through doesn't give our game access to the camera feed. This can be a bit of a problem when we're trying to destroy the mesh. Suddenly we don't have texture data to let us bash the mesh inward or outward. Uh, we can only show where the mesh, like what is actually there in your room through this pass-through. So when we were designing our wall destruction mechanics, we made sure that every time things would come in and out, we would shatter the wall completely. Um, when these chunks of the user's room are shattered, there's no texture data for that. We make sure that this is hidden from the player by using various visual effects. And similarly, these pieces are short-lived. Uh, in playing, players never really notice that this texture is missing. The scene mesh is itself a single concave, uh, large concave mesh that can have a very large number of triangles, especially for large detailed rooms. While working with scene mesh, um, it became useful for us to be able to change the level of detail of the mesh. So at startup of our game, we first subdivide any large triangles in order to improve the visual quality of shattered surfaces. Afterwards, we, we decimate the mesh to make sure that the triangles are of at least a minimum size for performance. We have a lot of leeway here because this mesh is never actually getting rendered. We're only using it to produce that alpha mask that shows the pass through. Um, so the only chance that you're gonna see for these, this quality of these triangles is against the virtual objects uh, whenever you have a silhouette. It's at this point that we process the mesh with our destruction system. At startup, we break the mesh up using Voronoi partitioning into chunks. These smaller chunks can be enabled or disabled at runtime to show through to that outside world. And any time we need to modify a mesh dynamically, it's much faster on these smaller chunks. Now, as we're destroying the player's room, it can easily become full of hidden obstacles if we're not careful. We have to be especially careful with furniture and objects uh, that the player has, um, because once they're invisible, um, the player could just trip over them and it would become a health hazard. To prevent this, we use a simple technique. We step the boundary of the room back by a third of a meter, and anything within this space, we reserve as indestructible. That way, the player can never lose track of it. Um, additionally, players can be very curious about any object you place just outside their space. They're going to want to go up and see it. But we still need them to know where their walls are so they don't walk into them. In order to give them a frame of reference for this, 
We reserve anything below three quarters of a meter as this wainscoting area. That makes sure that players never lose track of their walls. Finally, if players do get so close, we will show pass through if their headset or their controllers get that close to a wall that we need to. So First Encounters introduces players to little creatures called Puffians to collect. These Puffians enter your room from the outside world and they help to create a sense of continuity between the inside and outside worlds of the game. It was important that the Puffians feel like they're actually moving around your room, climbing up on furniture and making a mess. It can't be stressed enough just how much animation and audio cues do to sell the idea that these Puffians are in your space. In addition to providing direct feedback when the Puffians bounce around and climb on objects in the room, by tying these cues to the Puffians' behaviors, they strongly convey an idea that the Puffians are thinking about and reacting to what's around them. The Puffians have a number of reactions and behaviors they exhibit in reaction to what's going on around them. When you see Puffians reacting to the, uh, the obstacles in the room, getting startled by other Puffians being captured, or grouping up and moving together through the player's space, it really helps to sell the idea that these creatures have goals in relation to the player's room. So the way that Puffians navigate your space and where they try to move to also has a big impact on selling this feeling of them being physically grounded in your room. We had to solve a number of interesting problems in order to, conv to create convincing movement that would also work well for the gameplay. One of the big problems with navigating the room was the unpredictability of your furniture placement. We wanted Puffians to be relatively easy to find as they moved through your room. It wasn't supposed to be an Easter egg hunt. If there was an awkward gap behind a couch that Puffians could fit into, it wasn't up to the player to fix that by pushing their couch against the wall. It's up to us to handle it and keep the Puffians out of there. And with the small size of these creatures, they could really fit into all sorts of spaces. You know, a typical room has a lot of places for things to hide inside, especially when your creatures are only six inches in diameter. We address this problem directly in the design of the Puffians navigation behaviors. Puffians want to be seen. Any time that a Puffian can't see the player, it'll try to move to a position where it can. They also really like to climb, so if they run into furniture or into a wall, they'll immediately start to climb up it. When Puffians are on top of your furniture or halfway up a wall, they're a lot easier to see than if they're hanging out on the baseboards, and it made for a much cooler experience. Another serious issue that we discovered here was that Puffians would get stuck inside of your furniture. So we realized that when you're scanning the scene mesh, there were sometimes large caves inside of furniture. It happened frequently with fabric, like on a couch or a bed. During the scan, the shape wasn't getting closed completely, and it turned the furniture into this big imaginary room for the Puffians to hang out in. Now, this problem happened a lot. Like, just about every scan that we were seeing had some caves in it, and there was no way that we could expect the player to catch this issue during the scanning process, and I don't think we could even communicate to them that this was going to be a problem. Scan data is never perfect, and I wanted to shield the player from that fact. So we wanted to give them a good experience regardless of the scan quality. The solution here, again, was to address it in the Puffian behaviors. We gave Puffians the ability to teleport out of caves to free themselves. So we came up with a way to detect if a Puffian was inside of a cave for more than a few seconds. And this was related to the line of sight to the player, as well as line of sight to the ceiling and floor planes. Uh, and if for more than a few seconds a Puffian was inside of a cave, it would just teleport to a position where it's in line of sight of the player. So even though we still had these caves in our scan, they were no longer a problem for gameplay. So creatures interacting in the player's room are the most likely to exhibit behavior that doesn't feel correct. We were careful when designing the Puffians to ensure they wouldn't break expectations when it came to their physical interactions within the scene. Despite this, it's not enough to avoid breaking the rules. We found that it was important to provide many additional cues to the player that indicate that these creatures are physically in the space. In addition to the animation and audio cues mentioned earlier, we had a number of simpler cues to implement. Drop shadows provided a sense that Puffians were physically on top of or close to objects around them. By making the Puffians fur extend outside of their colliders, we gave ourselves a margin of error so that when they were resting on surfaces, they wouldn't look disconnected. Finally, squashing and stretching the Puffians as they throw themselves around the room and collide with objects gave a much stronger sense of impact.
Now, another interesting topic for us to explore is the concept of locomotion in mixed reality. We had some limited insights into this with First Encounters, but there's a lot of depth to this problem that other games will have to further explore. The problem essentially comes down to how a player moves through their space. The player has a very different level of freedom and restriction on their movement compared to traditional or even virtual reality games. The player exists physically in their space, and we have to design both for them and for their room. We find ourselves in a situation where we have no control over where the player can move. So in a traditional game, if a player is walking into a virtual wall, they'll collide with it, and they'll stop moving. In mixed reality, we can't stop you from walking. Not only that, if the player wants to actually walk out of the room into the virtual world, we can't give them a way to teleport or locomote out into that virtual space because there's no way for us to represent your physical space from any point of view other than the headset's actual physical location. Games need to be designed with this unpredictable movement in mind, and they need to remember that players will have different levels of mobility and different size play spaces. So related to this, pausing the game is a really fun example of where things get weird. In a traditional game, when you pause the game, you also pause the player's movement. You can't walk around while the pause menu's up. In mixed reality, we can't stop the player from walking. So when the player unpauses, suddenly they could be in a completely different position than when they pause the game. Imagine your game has NPCs trying to follow or track the player or shoot at them. This could be extremely disruptive to the gameplay. So in First Encounters, we just took the easy way and we chose not to address this. We let the player walk through a frozen snapshot of the game while it was paused. And for us, we felt that seeing the game frozen in space was just a really cool effect. We wanted to preserve this even if we knew this was something that players could take advantage of. If a player was motivated to, they could use the pause feature in the game to find hidden puffians, line up the perfect shot, and get a higher score. But for our purposes, we felt that this was fine. We cared a lot more about giving the player a lot of agency and adapting the game around them. It just wouldn't be worth sacrificing such a potentially cool pause behavior in order to prevent cheating in what was just a non-competitive game anyway. Other games, of course, will have their own considerations, and I could see this being a really important problem for them to address along with mobility in general, and uh, you'll have to find different approaches to deal with this. So that brings us to our closing thoughts. We gained so many insights when we were working on First Encounters, and I hope that sharing some of these will help you as you develop your own games in mixed reality. We believe that mixed reality has the potential to really redefine the player's experience with more direct interactions and a level of physicality that we just haven't seen before in games. First Encounters only gave us a, gl a glimpse of this potential and we're both so excited to see how the space is going to grow. It feels important to note that designers are only just starting to explore and define the design language for mixed reality games. There's a lot of potential to explore new player verbs, methods of interaction, and establish new player expectations that can create new genres unique to mixed reality. When you're designing your game, please consider whether our framework of giving the player interactions that are tangible within their play space, intangible outside of their play space, and uh, combining and contrasting the two can help you in uh, designing your game. Thank you. If anyone has... <laughs>There was a mesh, like presumably for collision and stuff, but as far as the actual texture, uh, was that some sort of shader or just billboard, billboarded bitmaps or what? Yeah, so the question was uh, for the Puffians, was the fur material a shader uh, or was it uh, geometry? Like how did we do that versus the actual uh, model that was used for physics? Uh, if you'd like to grab it. So the answer is kind of both. So we use billboarded quads on a mesh, but we apply a custom shader to that to give it the illusion of dynamic fur. And we animate that fur in the shader, as well as the eyes. The eyes are all uh, driven through a shader, similar to uh, you know, a tune shader that you might find in a classic game. Yeah. So the, the actual collision mesh itself is just a smaller sphere inside, so. Thanks. No problem. Um, thank you for the very inspiring talk. Um, we. I'm as a student uh, developer, we're working 
working on a project uh, of a MR experience inside of a church, which is a much larger scale and much complicated uh, ground plane. So I wonder, um, in your process, how did you, um, what's the connection with like the meta boundary modes and how did you uh, cover any issue? Did you, yeah. So, yeah. so the question is about uh, what boundary mode we use for this game uh, in mm -hmm. context of a, a large scale mixed reality game. Um, so for this, a lot of the alignment came from the anchoring approach that we took, but mm -hmm. as well, we're using the stage tracking mode through uh, OVR Manager. Um, but really, most of it comes down to anchoring. So in such a large space, you may want to investigate using multiple anchors. Uh, I would definitely recommend adjusting the camera position and potentially interpolating the offset that you apply to the camera as you move between anchors. So you, use, uh, you, you apply an influence to the closest anchor to have the uh, most effect on the camera position. Yeah, as well, um, it's worth noting that everything here is room scale. Mm -hmm. And so um, when you're scanning a large mesh like a church, um, you have an opportunity at startup in your game to potentially um, try to simplify that mesh a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, you don't have that at design time. So if you're noticing any issues that's coming from uh, dealing with a large mesh, um, I would recommend looking into plugins for decimation and, and level of detail. Yeah, thank you so much. Do we have time for one more question? No, okay, right. we're at time. Thanks, everybody. We'll, get your we'll be outside, outside. Uh, and we'll take any more questions. Thanks so much.